Here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. Yeah, the, the question I get from a lot of people is, should I take up reloading? Or sometimes it's, maybe I'll get back into it. I haven't reloaded for a while. I still got my stuff back there. Uh, it's one of those conversations that there's no end to how far you can go with it, and it's a lot of fun. And one of the guys I do exactly that with is an old friend of mine, Robin Sharpless from uh, Reading Reloading. He joins us right now. Robin, how are you, sir? Very good. Merry Christmas. Good to talk to you, Tom. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Now, um, I guess we'll probably ought to do just a quick uh, recap for those who might not know the name Reading. And uh, give me a little bit of history. Reading was founded in 1946. Their first product was a, a, a bullet and powder scale. Uh, the company has remained within 20 miles of where it's founded in upstate New York, uh, family-owned. And uh, con- current ownership uh, goes back to 1974. We, uh, Interestingly enough, for many, many years we were viewed as a niche player, and then the market sort of caught up with us because – you know, we had done a, the company had been well known for in the bench rest community, the long range precision shooting community, and of course, Tom, right. you're, I know you're very aware of the changes that have happened in our market and where the excitement is in all the long range. Well, um, we became a, a much larger and yet still 100 percent American made, still under one roof in one place in one little town company, um, servicing those needs of the long range precision shooter as well as everyone else. But that really was our that's always was our stock and trade. If I might, you know, when you go back to the Warren Page days, uh, bench rest shooting was the big deal. Redding yep. was known as, if you, when you wanted the really quality stuff, you bought Redding reloading dies, Redding reloading equipment for bench rest shooting. Uh, I would say that all we've done is take bench rest shooting from 100 yards to 1,000 yards. We have, and I, I, I will tell you, what, one of the things I've found very interesting is if we look back historically, and we look back at what a, a pretty well-performing bench rest rifle looked like 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. We're hunting with that right now. <laughs> huh. Interesting. In yeah, terms yeah. of the capability and, and, and the capacity. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, they were shooting teeny tiny groups back then. And yep. the bench rest competition world was basically the NASCAR because they developed things that ended up going into our car slash guns. And particularly with cartridges and the sharp shoulder and all the rest of it, the PPC exactly. cartridges became the, the WSMs became the, you know, the 284 became the, the Creedmoors. Right. Right. So and that, you know, that it, evolution it, continues um, and, and, and hand loading continues with it. Okay. In the old days, which means when I was getting started in this, you hand loaded for a couple of reasons. One is because factory ammo, frankly, wasn't all that good, and you could basically make it a lot more accurate. And number two, you did it as a hunter, and I guess as a target shooter, to get bullets that you couldn't get in factory ammo. These days, factory ammo is really good, and you can actually get factory ammo with a lot of interesting premium bullets. So why do people reload that now? I think we I think we just look at the the expansion because as factory ammo has become so much better, so many more niche bullet makers are out there, so many more opportunities. Um, you know, we're we're dealing with twist rates now in ways we never did before, and we're running mm-hmm. much heavier bullets in thirty cal's and six fives and sixes than we ever did before because we've we've got properly twisted barrels, and it gets back to the same thing with with hand loading. We have that wonderful ability to to make it do make a rifle do more, be more accurate, or do things that you never thought it was really intended for at its inception. It's an interesting way to put it. It's you not only make your rifle shoot better, you can make your rifle do things that it simply could never do before because you got a, frankly you got a different rifle. You got the faster twist rate and. That cannot be overemphasized. The fast twist rate and the VLD bullets today are a completely new category. That, and I know there's some people still say, well, I don't really need that. Except that even if you're a hunter, if you say, well, I'm not going to shoot past 400 yards. Okay, cool. Uh, the drop doesn't really matter, frankly. Uh, but the wind drift can be cut in half with these high BC bullets. And it may be that you need a fast twist rate. You can get that in a factory uh, 6.5 Creedmoor. But you could also get it by rebarreling your other 
you know, say you got a 270, right. say, say you got an yeah. all six, you can rebarrel that with a faster twist rate and start taking advantage of it, but only if you reload. Correct. And one of the interesting things, and you just touched on it, is the idea that, that BC is really three dimensional. And a lot of people think of it as, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm going to shoot flatter. Well, BC, mm-hmm. uh, high, you know, high BC bullets are less affected by wind in every area. So you, you know, you're going to wind up with far less drift um, on something, you know, with a higher, with a higher BC. Um, it, it's just, it's really, you know, there's another thing that comes into play, and and because I'm part of it as well, that our aging market is becoming a little more recoil sensitive, and you know, mm-hmm. the idea that we can make a six five do what a thirty cal used to, or we can make a six do what a thirty cal used to, um, in terms of um, ballistic efficiency giving us advantages at distance that those cartridges didn't used to have. So we wind up with a low, you know, the ability to create very unique lower recoiling rounds that still have the same terminals as 30 cals did, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. I, I call them magic bullets, Robin. I mean, it's the high BC bullets, supposed to coefficient bullets, long skinny bullets. Yep. If you can spin them up with a faster twist rate barrel, they do things that we couldn't simply could not do before. And so if you are 50 years or older, you're, you're not even used to thinking in terms of that. And I want to go back to what you said. You can make a 6.5 Creedmoor hit harder than a 30 out 6. You can make a 6 millimeter hit harder than a 270 at anything past about 300 yards. It's just quite amazing when you start running the numbers. It's like, what's going on here? This is, like I say, it's PFM. It's just magic. Yep. Yep. Well, I, and it is. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, evolution of technology, you know, and we have better bullets, we have better designers, we have better computer programs to help design those bullets. Um, as you remember, I was, I was way back in the, in the early days of shy I was part of that. And, mm-hmm. you know, we were facing the military establishments of the world with a 419 grain 408 bullet saying, well, you know, once you pass 400 yards, we have better kinetics than a 50. Well, how do you do that? Well, we retain energy and we don't waste energy with a tremendous amount of yaw as in the first couple of hundred yards. You know, the, the mm-hmm. classic, well, the bullet doesn't settle down until it gets out to such and such. Right. Well, if we can do a better job with the bullet to control that, and it's, that bullet is not shedding all of that velocity through yaw and through other issues, we wind up a distance with a much better performing bullet with better kinetics. But exactly. Tell you what, let me take a quick break here. We're getting pretty far down in the weeds. When we come back, I want to talk, uh, Robin, about how do you get started in hand loading? What do you need if you said, okay, I want to get started? What's the basics? Okay, I want to pick up on a couple of things we were talking about. We're talking with Robin Sharpless from uh, Reading Reloading Equipment. And Robin, uh, first of all, I want to send people back to your website, Redding dot re- or Redding-Reloading.com. And if you click on your loading manual, you've got an article by Stan Terzoniak. It's one of the best I've seen in terms of how do you get started? What does it take to reload metallic cartridges? It is really a, a picture number, step by step. It's a great, great thing you got there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it, really you well know, it, Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and the other thing is, we mentioned it briefly, and I know there are people who's thinking, well, I don't shoot 700 yards. I don't shoot uh, long range stuff. I don't do you know, all that F class stuff. I don't do all. Uh, why do I care? And my point would be, if you are a hunter and you're out shooting anything at 300 plus yards, pronghorns, mule deer, whatever, even, frankly, even whitetail in a lot of places, you're shooting bean fields and open areas, you could be shooting a ways. Here's the important thing. Your bullet is affected by wind. And the point of that is, once it leaves the muzzle of your rifle, you are no longer in control of it. There are invisible forces that are variable that are moving your bullet around. And if you're proghorn hunting, it could easily be 20, 25, 30 miles an hour, which at, call it 350 yards, we're talking about anywhere from 12 to 18 inches a wind drift, depending on what you're shooting. If you can cut that in half simply by choosing a different bullet, you have just greatly increased your chances of success. Is that fair? That's absolutely right. And the other piece that always comes into play is that through that, through the rest of the year, when you're working with that rifle, you can minimize other issues 
And, you know, we can, you know, factory ammo is good, but factory ammo is made to work in all the rifles. When you hand load, you get to build rifle uh, ammo that works in your rifle. So somebody says, that, or, 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 let me back up, because there's, God, there's so much for us to talk about. But you told me recently <laughs> you have had such an increase in demand for reloading equipment, and not just from the U.S. Right, worldwide. Um, hand loading is, is becoming more and more popular worldwide for the very same reasons. I mean, when, when America runs out of ammo, the rest of the world runs out of ammo. But the, one of the big, interesting sleeper markets out there is Eastern Europe, because these formerly communist countries, you know, if we look at many of them, they had the same type of shooting sports traditions as Germany and Switzerland and, and, and let's say, freer countries mm-hmm. in, in Europe had, except mm-hmm. under the communist domination, they had no ability to own powder. They had no ability to do the things they were doing. Sure. And so you're really looking at a renaissance or a resurgence in you know, the precision shooting sports, and, and I tell people the crazy part about it is the, the newer European, and when I say Eastern European, we'll talk even to, the, to, to Belarus and places like that. They don't buy standard dyes. They're buying bushing dyes and competition seeders because they're all about you know, accuracy, precision, and, and competition because it's, it's their history, their yeah. shooting sports history. So how far out are you on delivery? What's the back order situation now? We're about 18 weeks right now wow. and uh, and that's with the inc- that's with adding 13 new pieces of american-made cnc machines since a year ago i mean literally just a year ago uh adding a whole lot of new talented people and quite frankly working as much overtime as our folks can, can stand now reading's about quality we don't subcontract anything we don't outsource anything we make it if you know if we can't make it in the house and make it right well I've told dealers for years, I said, you know, you may not get everything you want, but everything you get, you're going to want to have. And you're making everything in the U.S.? Yep, everything in the U.S., 100%. Not only that, you told me that even the CNC machines, and some of the you know the Japanese machines are very good, some of the other machines, but you're actually specifying that your CNC machines come from America, too. That is correct. We run American machines, we run American steel, and, of course, American labor. Uh, again, all in up here in central New York, and I know... Folks say, well, wish you weren't, you know, wish you must be terrible to live in New York. Well, where we are is some of the most beautiful land and hunting you're going to run across. Unfortunately, we don't have the greatest government. But yeah. um, we, you know, while we are tempted by other places, we are we are also committed to a workforce that got us from where the company was in 1946 to where it is today. And we, we wouldn't do anything to hurt them and hurt their families and hurt their futures either. So we're kind of rock solid and committed here for, for quite some time. Well, I applaud the loyalty. Okay, somebody wants to get into reload. They say, okay, I don't yep. know anything about it. I want to start, I want, you know, frankly, I mean, I'm just going to say this. If, they, if they're looking at Reading, they're saying, I like the good stuff. I want to buy the good stuff. I want to buy once, cry once. I want to get the good stuff. I don't have to replace it later because it doesn't work right. What are we looking at? What's, give me a dollar figure because that's what everybody always wants to know, isn't it? Yeah, and, and it's, it's I'm, not, I'm going to tell you, it's not insignificant. You're going to probably come in and do a good job. You're going to probably be spending oh seven or eight hundred dollars to get started. But right. I will turn this around in that in one way, and that is that the, uh, if you will, the payback. You know, when do I break even? When do I start getting ahead? Well, mm-hmm. that's faster than it ever was because you know, back in the old days, we used to say, well, you know, reloading with with, with reloading, you can you can load quality ammunition for about half what it costs you, mm-hmm. and. Um, that that you know that wasn't quite as exciting when we used to be able to buy boxes of five five six for four dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> the interesting thing is that that brass that we get to use over and over again is still the largest the largest component in terms of the cost structure of ammunition. Right. And so you know if and, and the more carefully we handle it, the easier we work on it, the more we make it last. Um, that's where our payback gets a lot faster. It- is it because, still saving about 50%? Yeah, it is. Um, it's still saving roughly 50% because all the costs have gone up. Well, but, you know, um, frank, frankly, time, it doesn't yeah. take a lot of ammo these days uh, to add up to six or $700 worth. You know, it just doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. In fact, uh, we did a thing a couple of years ago where we actually went into um, a catalog of one of our major resellers that also sells, you know, primers, powder, and all the rest back. Mm-hmm. And we basically went in and we looked at and, and as best possible with the same bullet, with the same, you know, with the same manufacturer's primer that would have come in at factory, et cetera, 
we uh, we were able to we were able to save fifty eight percent to basically duplicate the load. So, you know, that's closer to uh, you know a sixty percent savings. And again, with with ammo costing so much more, um, you know, if primers free up, if powder comes down a little bit, things like that happen. Your payback on that on those on all the hardware is going to be that much faster. Um, and, and look, I've, I've had people call the show and say, you know, I want to get into it. I just I don't know what I need. And I say, look, if you have no idea what you need, buy the kit because the manufacturers, yep. you guys, you know, and the people who make reloading equipment, you have these kits, and it's pretty much everything you need, is it not? It is. And we, we a few years ago, we stepped out of the fold because of where we are in terms of the precision business. You know, most of the industry offers a kit that's a very basic beginner kit. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sat down with our catalog one weekend and, and came up with what became our Versa Pack. Because if we look, the vast majority of kits out there have a relatively small press. Um, mm-hmm. The Versa Pack, we made a decision to create a really, really complete kit. And by that, I mean it's got a case trimmer, it's got a powder throw. So we're not just, mm-hmm. you know, it's got a powder measure, not just a, a, a scale and a trickler. Uh, okay. We put all that together in the Versa Pack. And the one, that, and we left out two, we left out two things. We left out the die and shell holder, which I count as one thing because that's going to be dependent on the cartridge right. you're Calibre. reloading. Right, right. And the other thing we left out was the press, because you may be loading something big, and you might want a big press like our Ultra Mag, or you may want the versatility of the T7 Turret Press. But we gave you everything else, down to even different types of case lubes, so you can learn along the way. It has a uh, it has a hydrogen powder manual in it, not the not the freebie they give away, but the actual one they print every year. And, you know, sell what, sell retail. What I, think, um, what I hear you saying is you can buy three things and you're good to go. You buy the Versa Pack, yep. you buy a yep. press, and then you get a set of dies with a shell holder, and you're good to go. Exactly. You know, what, other than your consumable components, but absolutely, oh, yes. yeah. Of course. You know, what do you, the, the, and you talk to people yeah. in the industry, what are you hearing about primers? Because, I mean, that's the, the real bottleneck right now. I keep hearing rumors about somebody's going to start you know, building a primer factory or something. What are you hearing? Uh, there's a couple of th- There's one thing, unfortunately, I've been sworn to secrecy on, um, but it does look like there is primer capacity out there in the U.S. that have been going unused, which is going to start to get used. And um, it's, it's, it's getting a little better. Um, from what we're hearing back from our folks in the field. So okay. um, there's a potential that we could see maybe a major announcement at SHOT Show um, mm-hmm. on primers. I'm hoping we do. Um, okay. I, I can't get into it too far because I don't want to – I don't just like you, I, I don't want to kill a good source. <laughs> I, I, I know. Look, I got a scoot. We're just out of time. And, Robin, you know, we could do this for about four hours. Um, well, actually, we have, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy every minute. Thank you. It's always fun. Robin Sharpus, thank you so much. Makers of really high-end, very good, but uh, affordable, if you will, when you want to buy good stuff, because you, you, you guys do make the good stuff. Thank you. All right. Uh, check it out. Redding, it's R-E-D-D-I-N-G, redding-reloading.com. If you thought you might want to get into that, take a look. Also, click on that the hand-loading guide they have. It pops right up, and you can actually read it. It's kind of like, oh, well, that's how you do it. That's it. That's not hard. I can do that. Well, yeah, you can. 